I'm Dr. Cody, and I'm going to give you a really unique perspective as we watch this CBS News story together on Colorado passing a law against these brain devices over privacy concerns for its users. I'm a US Navy trained psychiatrist and I've been working with this brain tech for over 10 years now and basically know all the people behind the development of this technology. And I'm really surprised how they're framing the brain wearable device industry in this video. I'll give you some behind the scenes information about how powerful this technology is really getting, what big tech is doing about it, and if we should be concerned about this new law that aims to protect your brain data. Advances in artificial intelligence are leading to medical breakthroughs once thought impossible, including devices that can actually read minds and alter our brains to help treat conditions like anxiety, Alzheimer's. But that technology raises privacy concerns. That's why Colorado passed a first of its kind law aimed at ensuring our private thoughts remain private. It's not just Colorado either. California and Minnesota are putting up similar bills as well. Your political reporter, Sean Boyd, joins us live from the Capitol tonight. Sean, this is really mind blowing even to think about. Who has <laughs> access to this technology? You know, Karen, everyone, believe it or not, you can buy devices on the internet right now that can, to varying degrees, decode your brain waves. And the technology being developed by the likes of Elon Musk, Apple, Meta, and OpenAI can change, enhance, and control your thoughts, emotions, even your memories. It's the dawn of a new era filled with promise and peril. All right, so Neuralink had their first human patient this year. Apple filed a patent to potentially put brainwave sensors into their ear pods. Even recently as last month, I've seen tech giants like Apple basically stealing employees away from these smaller neurotech companies to work on their own stealth brain computer interface projects, which is totally wild. I myself have had calls with Samsung. I know Meta has several projects under the works. And the Sam Altman OpenAI project is very stealth right now, but there are rumors that they're looking into ultrasound tech for brain computer interface. And I'm actually pretty familiar with that tech. Last summer, I went to a lab where they did an MRI brain scan and then specifically pulsed my caudate with ultrasound during a meditation session and made me incredibly euphoric during the experience. And those ultrasound pucks can be fit into a wearable at some point. So it is possible that we could get mood enhancement from a wearable like that. The thing you wanted to do, you can move your computer with your mind and you can control it with your mind using this device. If you think telepathy or mind control is the stuff of science fiction, think again. This is kind of like the first consumer grade brain computer interface um, that anyone can have and anyone can control their computer um, using this technology. It's called neurotechnology and neurologist Sean Pazowski at UC Health says it's revolutionizing healthcare, enabling people who can't move or speak to do what was previously thought impossible, communicate with just a thought or expression. It's called neurotechnology. One of the use cases for a neurotech like this emotive epoch would be to be able to move a mouse cursor on a screen without using your hands and just your mind alone. It's actually quite difficult to do that with a device like this. It's trying to pick up very minute brain signals off of your scalp. It can be done, but it's actually easier to pick up eye and facial movements a lot because your muscles produce electrical signals as well. You can actually see him on this report moving his eyes back and forth, and I think that he's doing some controls with his eyes. But there are algorithms that you can train by imagining that you're biting into a lemon or trying to move your left hand. I've found responses like that to be quite difficult to train and highly variable and way less reliable than implantable devices like Neuralink. They just had their first Neuralink patient, Nolan Arbaugh, go on Joe Rogan and talk about how when he wants to move the mouse cursor, it actually sometimes even moves before he makes the conscious decision, like it's at precognition level. Sometimes it's so good that it's moving before I even like think it to move. But people are getting better and better results in controlling mouse cursors with devices like this. The consumer level devices that you can get right now to train models to control a mouse cursor are primarily emotive and neurosity, but there are higher end research grade devices like the Cognition Axon R or OpenBCI that are working on this too. You could use this device to move the cursor to the letter that you wanted. And then if you wanted that letter, you could just smile and give the command to enter that. 
This headset, one of 30 devices you can now buy on the Internet to peer into your brain and, in some cases, alter it. So it, it is actually modulating and stimulating your brain to help you get a better night's sleep. The devices promise to not only improve brain function but identify impairments. Pazowski is using the technology at UC Health to detect epileptic seizures as they happen. Which we were never able to do that before. This takes out all the guesswork and allows us to change medications in real time. If the at-home devices are impressive, those being used in the lab are even more so. Our brain waves are like encrypted signals, and using artificial intelligence, researchers have cracked the code. The AI enhancement of these capabilities has been totally nuts over the last couple of months. I've been loading my brainwave data from this Muse headband into ChatGPT, and it's giving me metrics like peak alpha, which is associated with IQ scores. It can tell if I'm meditating, if my eyes are open or closed based on the brain data alone. Last month, ChatGPT told me that based on my alpha scores, it's likely that I'm a meditator, which I am. I'm a daily meditator, and it could tell that from the brain data alone. It's crazy. Identifying frequencies for specific words to turn thought to text with 40% accuracy. You give it a few years, and we're probably talking 80%, 90%. That I just think it, and AI knows what I'm thinking. Yes. Because of the pattern of my brain wave. Yes. AI is definitely supercharging everything and it's coming along quickly. But for example, my friend Andreas with Cognition told me that it's often relatively easy to get to 40 to 60% accuracy in speech prediction and other things that you can do with EEG. But it's much more difficult to get to like 80 or 95% accuracy, which most consumers would want out of a device that was really reliable to do this kind of thing. I'm hoping that we can get there in the next five years. Only time will tell. Not only do words have distinctive brain patterns, so do conditions like Alzheimer's, anxiety, and addiction. Conditions researchers are working to reverse using electrical stimulation to alter the frequencies or regions of the brain where the condition originates. The benefits are going to be off the charts. Uh, patients are going to have dozens of more options. But with the benefits come risks. It is some of the most sensitive data that you could possibly share with anyone. Data insurance companies could use to discriminate, law enforcement to interrogate, and advertisers to manipulate. Government, too, could get into our heads and potentially alter our thoughts, emotions, and memories as the technology advances. What's difficult about these news programs is that they lump all the potential capabilities into one sentence. Like right now with this emotive epoch device, you could detect seizure activity to diagnose someone with epilepsy and then have a health insurance company discriminate against them because of that. So theoretically, that could be a concern with epilepsy. But the next level up, in most cases, it wouldn't be able to do that for like depression or anxiety because those signals are much more subtle and nuanced. And we don't have high enough diagnostic accuracy for that yet. So an insurance company probably could not use brain data to discriminate for anxiety or depression yet. Things like law enforcement interrogation are coming along. Nita Farinhani talked about this quite a bit in her book, Battle for Your brain, where there's some reports that people are able to get the recordings of brainwave signals of people while showing them pictures of crime scenes and victims and get pretty reliable brain data on if they recognize those scenes or not. That could be used in prosecution theoretically. And brain data for marketing purposes is still really early stage, but Emotive has been doing work with companies like L'Oreal to see how people respond to fragrances, for example, and give them what fragrance they responded best to. Nobody wants to live in a world where some of these misuses or abuses exist. While medical research facilities are subject to privacy laws, private companies that are amassing large caches of brain data are not. And based on a study by the Neural Rights Foundation, two-thirds of them are already sharing or selling the data with third parties. To me, there's just a big difference between sharing and selling data to third parties. For example, MindLift is a company that works with the Muse headband to create neurofeedback protocols for practitioners and their clients. Muse allows them to access the raw brainwave data and MindLift creates software around that to give really great capabilities to the entire platform. That really just enhances the service and isn't anything nefarious like selling brainwave data to an insurance or marketing company, for example. 
and people's data only goes to MindLift if they're actually using the MindLift service. But I'm sure there's neuroscience data that's been shared between the two companies in discussions to make the products better. I'm not aware of any real selling of neural data in bulk to third parties like insurance companies or marketing agencies to gain more information about people specifically. The data is typically de-identified from the individual users and used in bulk to make neuroscience insights either to improve the product, which is usually neurofeedback at this point, but could be used to control mouse cursors and that type of thing, or the de-identified bulk data is used to publish findings in neuroscience, which for example, the Muse has so many users at this point that they're finding signals according to gender and age that we've never seen before. And that's being used to totally transform the neuroscience field. So using that de-identified data for those purposes, I think is actually a really good thing. Obviously you wouldn't want to be selling it to insurance companies and whatnot. And I think that's what this Colorado legislation is trying to prevent. So as you can see, there's a lot of gray areas here in my mind about what we're talking about when we look into sharing data with third parties, because there's a lot of caveats to that. The vast majority of them also don't disclose where the data is stored, how long they keep it, who has access to it, and what happens if there's a security breach which is why Pazowski, medical director of the foundation, led the passage of a first-in-the-nation law in Colorado that includes biological or brain data in the State Privacy Act, similar to fingerprints, if the data is being used to identify people. This is a first step, but we still have a, um, a long way to go. And with companies and countries racing to access, analyze, and alter our brains, Pazowski says privacy protections should be a no-brainer. Mendy, Muse, Emotive, Focus, Calm, IDUN, Friends. These are literally all the companies that I've been working with for the last five to 10 years. I think one that they missed on this list in terms of wearables is Neurosity, which is actually quite prominent. I mean, Grimes has been using it on live shows. Some, some other musicians have been using it. And Neurosity is a great example of a group that has been very forthcoming about saying that they would never sell your brain data that's an encrypted and de-identified and stored in a secure location. If you look at their website, I think it's a really good example of the steps that these other companies need to take if they haven't already to meet these new privacy laws that are coming along. And I would agree that these companies need to get on a certain level as far as data safeguarding to reflect what's happening with this legislation and demonstrate that on their websites and consumer information packages. Really what this Colorado bill is doing is folding the neurotechnology consumer products into previous legislation called the Colorado Privacy Act. Act that has rules about disclosing to consumers how their personal data is collected and used. It allows the consumer to have access to that data and ask for it to be deleted or corrected if they want to. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out into neurotech companies that often in the past have provided proprietary metrics and not actually access to the raw brainwave data. It's everything that we are. You know, it's, it's everything about our thoughts, our emotions, our memories, our intentions. The new law takes effect August 8th, but it's unclear which companies will be subject to it because, again, it only applies to those that are using the data to identify people. It's also unclear how it will be enforced, especially against those companies that are out of the country. Pazowski and the Neural Rights Foundation are pushing for a federal law and even a global accord. They don't want brain data to end up like DNA data that people sent to genealogy sites only to learn that they shared or sold it to a third party. It's crazy with AI what we're able to do already. We can already identify a person with 100% accuracy based on their EEG patterns. It's basically like a fingerprint at this point. I just don't understand how they would enforce this on the level of one state where these companies are primarily internet companies that sell their devices online. Like if you were in Colorado, would you not be able to order a Muse or a Mendy if they didn't comply with the regulations? I think they would have to get to the federal level with this legislation to have much more of an impact, honestly. After all, the privacy of our mind may be the only privacy we have left. Karen and Michaela. Yeah, so fascinating, Sean, just taking all of this in. We have some questions for you. Yeah. So how much do these at-home devices cost and how well do they work? 
most of them are in the $200 to $400 range, or some are in the thousands of dollars. Because they're marketed as wellness devices, they're not regulated by the FDA. But Pazowski says the ones that he's tried do work, but they only work if you have those sensors attached to your head. Elon Musk has developed an implantable chip that actually allows you to move a cursor, for example, with just your thoughts. Mm. And Sean, we're also wondering, can any, any of these devices actually control a person's thoughts? Not a person's, Michaelia, but they have been used to control the thoughts of mice in a lab. Mm. All right, so much to take in. Ah. Sean, thank you for that report. I don't like how they're lumping these wearables that are really just data collection devices at this point and comparing them to implantable electrical stimulation chips they put into the brains of rats and mice. Even though they both fall into the category of neurotechnology, they're really completely different things. I know they can't spell out the details in a six minute news report, but they need to educate people on the differences because these wearable technology devices could do a ton of good for society, like assess people with paralysis or detect seizures before they even happen. And we don't wanna throw them out because of fear of stuff that's been done in the lab that's actually very far away from directly impacting humans with free will anytime soon. And I'm making reference to rats and mice that are being affected by devices implanted in their brains, which is really far away from what these wearable devices are going to be able to do anytime soon. I mean, I had some ultrasound pulses affect my mood, but being able to control my memory or my thought processes is way out of the question at this point for that. But the AI progress is quite baffling and people are taking initial steps with this legislation, which I think is important. I was shocked how ChatGPT analyzed my own brain data. I took my brainwave data from this Muse headband and uploaded it into OpenAI ChatGPT. And it actually could tell that I was a daily meditator based on the brainwave data alone. So if you want to see how I did that, check out this video here and I'll see you on the other side.